Thank you very much, Brian. Um, before I introduce the first speaker, I would like to thank the sponsors for the symposium, and that's Lenovo, HPE, and AWS. So thank you so much. Without sponsorship, these events would not be possible. And with that, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Rick, Rick Stevens, which I actually don't know. There he is. Okay. Um, so Rick is a professor of computer science at the Un University of Chicago, as well as the associate laboratory director of the Computing Environment and Life Science Directorate in Argonne, distinguished fellow at Argonne National Laboratory. Wow, what a, <laughs> what a title. Um, Rick is focusing on developing AI methods. He's also the PI of the Bacterial Viral Bioinformatics Research Center, which is developing comparative analysis tools for infectious disease research. And he's also exploring the potential of artificial intelligence and machine learning to advance low-dose radiation biology research. So I'm very um, excited to hear um, what you're all doing and learning a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right. I have a lot of stuff. I'm not going to talk about all of it because uh, how much time do I have anyway? I don't know. Anybody know? Five hours? I have five hours? Okay. I flew 27 hours to get here. I think I should get one hour for every five hours on the airplane. Is that, is that right? Okay. Here we go. What I'm going to talk about, is there somewhere to see it? Ah, here. Okay. I'm going to talk about what we're doing in the U.S., now that we've achieved exascale. And there's actually a ton of stuff on the landscape, out in the landscape that we're trying to do, right? And uh, I'm just gonna jump right into it. You'll, it'll start to make sense in a little while, maybe about hour three, okay? Um, so um, what are all the things that we're thinking about? So one is how do we deliver the exascale promise, right? When we started the exascale initiative back in 2007, it was that long ago when we first had the first town hall meetings about whether it was possible to build exascale machines. And then about seven years ago, we actually started to get real money. Uh, but now uh, that we've delivered the machines, the program is kind of ramping down and it has to become more sustainable. So what are we doing there and how do we work with everybody, our international partners, to maintain progress uh, along those dimensions to deliver on exascale science? The thing that's consuming almost all of my time right now is AI. Um, there's, as you can't, if, unless you were asleep or dead, you would know that there's a massive revolution going on. And Sam Altman keeps following me around the world. I was in Munich when he was there. I'm here, and he's going to uh, Melbourne in a couple of days. Um, but uh, there's a, a huge uh, initiative that's building in the United States and around the world around AI, and in particular around AI for science. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, Quantum, it's hard to uh, be active without uh, hearing and, and talking about uh, where we're going with quantum. And I'll talk about uh, my thoughts on that and, and where we see uh, that going. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, the next uh, three orders of magnitude, uh, zeta scale, right? Um, and uh, we actually have been reorganizing the acronyms. So uh, the way we kind of think about the future right now is we call it easy Q. It doesn't mean that quantum is gonna be easy. It means that we have to do exascale, we have to take advantage of AI, we have to build uh, pathways to zeta scale, and we have to create quantum computing. That's the four plan program for the next 20 years. And so I'll give you some sense of that. So first we'll start with E, exascale. Well, um, in my lab, um, just down the road from University of Chicago, where I spend half of my time, uh, we've been standing up Aurora. Um, and uh, I'll show you a picture of uh, the configs of Aurora. Um, since January, or, well, December or so, um, we've had uh, lots of people up on a machine called Sunspot. This is a, a picture, this is two racks. Uh, Aurora is 166 of these racks. This is an additional two racks. This is a machine we call Sunspot. Um, if you were looking at it just as a separate uh, standalone machine, it's about a uh, 27 petaflop uh, system in uh, FP64 and about 450 petaflops in uh, brain float 16. So it's about half of a exaflop uh, for 16 bit that you would do, say, for uh, uh, large scale AI training. Um, it's a, the same hardware as in Aurora, it's just a small test bed that we've been running for uh, now about six months. And uh, uh, we have about a couple hundred people on it. Um, this is what a node board looks like. Uh, 
I won't uh, dive too deeply into that. Um, on Aurora, uh, we have uh, a large number of applications that have been built as we were uh, standing up the Exascale Computing Project. You might uh, know about that. It's been ongoing for about seven years, uh, invested in about 30 large application projects and about 80 projects in the software technology to build a complete stack. This gives you a sense of the status of porting. Uh, some of these codes will uh, make sense uh, for, for different people. Um, if you're interested in astrophysics, the Flash uh, Thornado code is the uh, thermonuclear uh, radiation hydro flash code that we use for simulating uh, supernovas. Um, Hack is a cosmology code and so forth. There's quite a few codes here. This is kind of sorted in terms of their readiness. So about two thirds of them are, are up and running on Aurora and a, another chunk is, is uh, being ported. Um, at the ISC conference a couple weeks ago, um, there was an extended series of presentations about the status of things with our machine. Uh, in the US, we have three exascale machines being built. Frontier that's already up and running is based on the AMD uh, CPUs and GPUs, Aurora, which is based on the Intel uh, Sapphire Rapids CPUs and the uh, Intel uh, Ponte Vecchio uh, GPUs. And then we have a machine that's coming up a little bit later this year at Livermore that's based on the AMD uh, MI300, right, which is their first uh, integrated GPU, CPU structure. And um, there's uh, you know, a lot of uh, progress in both in getting highly tuned kernels and getting large scale uh, applications up and running. One of the side effects of uh, building the Exascale Computing Project is that we had to stand up a portable software stack that runs on all of our Exascale platforms. This is called the um, Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack, or E4S. Uh, this is being led by Mike Caro and Lois uh, Kerfman. Um, and this is an open source stack that has an entire environment for doing scientific computing. It's all containerized. It runs on dozens of different platforms. And it's something you could actually, you know, if this was live, you could go and click and download it. You could get different containers and you can stand it up on your machine. And if you were interested in collaborating with US uh, application teams that are partnering on our Exascale, this is the target software platform. Of course, it, it can be decomposed into whatever components are interesting for you. I, I won't go through the details in here. There's a lot of um, details in the deck. You'll, you'll, you can uh, download it. It uses SPAC, which is a high performance computing system package building environment, which keeps track of package dependencies and allows you to build uh, industrial strength, you know, software uh, platform applications uh, in this environment and to resolve dependencies and so on. And it runs on basically all of the uh, modern uh, technology, different CPU types, different GPU types, um, and uh, is really the integrated core of what we've built um, in Exascale. Now, what should we be doing post Exascale, right? And in particular, what could we be doing together, right? I'm here, uh, you know, partly on a mission to try to find like-minded collaborators, and I don't mean just for me, but I mean for the U.S. as a whole, to plug in to the effort of post Exascale. And there's three big lessons that we're trying to learn from. One is that it's, it took us seven years to build the software and applications and to uh, develop and deploy the hardware. We want to learn from those lessons and pass that on to the next generation and build teams that we don't forget how to do that. These things are not happening so frequently that we have a, a team that's doing it you know, every year, so th that's one goal. The second is, I mentioned this before, fulfilling the promise of exascale applications. How do we get the broader community to move their applications on exascale machines? How do we get them to build applications on top of the software base? How do we just plug it into the ecosystem, empower workflows at exascale? And then how do we somehow preserve the investments that we've made, the billions, I mean, exascale was a $1.8 billion program, just the applications and software, in addition to a couple billion dollars on the hardware. So how do we continue to get value out of that over the next decade? So these are things that we would like to talk about uh, collaborating on. Right? Uh, I mentioned these applications uh, worldwide. If you add up what's being done in the US, what's done in Australia, what's done in Japan, Europe, there's probably 100 codes, uh, probably more than that, not including the, the system software, that actually have been ported to these target platforms. 
and there's hundreds more that actually need to be ported. So one of this is one of the challenges that we have. Um, we want to look at high throughput workflows where exascale applications are components in those workflows. These are particularly important at moving this technology into industry, so we need to work on that. Um, we're looking at how we can use AI to actually manage simulations, and we're looking at how we can use AI surrogates, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, to actually accelerate uh, kernels in our applications, or in some cases have end-to-end -end application replacements. Uh, many use cases for Exascale involve this concept of a digital twin, right, where we're trying to control or inform decision making on some complex environment and we need a simulation of that complex system, whether it's a reactor or an aircraft or an engine or a power grid, and we need to build models that are orders of magnitude faster than real time in order to use them to actually guide decision making. In many cases that means having to take the physics-based model as a start and build an AI-based surrogate that can run perhaps a thousand, or in some cases uh, more, faster than that. Um, so digital twins is an interesting strategy of, of using Exascale. In the context of AI-managed simulation, here's a, uh, a concept that we're working on. So if you have a, uh, some simulation that's going over here, this might not be an Exascale simulation, it could be even a uh, so not a, it could be a desktop simulation, it could be something that's, that's running. And the idea is that you want to have access to something like a large language model that can take output of this simulation, encode it in a way that it can uh, ingest it, and then make some decision about how to improve driving that model, say, closer to uh, you know, some goal that you have, and adjust the uh, constraints on the model or adjust some parameters and iterate. And we're starting to see this kind of an application structure get formulated. Some people have been following this idea of auto GPT. How many people have heard, played with auto GPT? You guys know this? This is GPT in a loop where it's able to do planning and execute program, write code and execute programs. This is kind of a super duper version of that as a way to think about it, is that in the future we think that users will be modulating or will be driving and monitoring and and interacting with their applications uh, via some kind of loop like this. So we have a, no, a number of projects where we're uh, working on, on that kind of a hookup. Another concept that we've been discussing with many vendors, um, and there's quite a lot of interest in this, is how to move the hardware ecosystem to something more sustainable. And I don't mean just replacing the power sources from natural gas or coal or some bad energy source to solar and wind, but I mean the hardware environment more sustainable. And the model that we have here is something like uh, an infrastructure. I'd love to imagine infrastructure would last a thousand years. I don't know how to do that, but let's say imagine one that could last 10 years, okay? Um, so a racks, power, cooling, maybe passive optics, and then having uh, technology building blocks that could be dropped into that, that could be upgraded on a very frequent basis against these standard uh, modules. So this is a concept uh, that uh, we're working on with a number of vendors. So you can think of this as building blocks that have just three connections, power, cooling, and optics, and the rest of the infrastructure is standardized. This is, if we're gonna build a spacefaring 10,000 year civilization, we have to move to technology like this. We can't just be doing these forklift rack upgrades um, all the time. So let me talk a little bit about A, um, the push in AI. Um, for those of you who, I had a slide in here for some reason that's not showing up about Aurora. Let me just give you a, just a one minute update on where Aurora is. So Aurora is completely built out. It's 166 racks, it's 63,000 GPUs. It's got 20,000 Sapphire Rapid CPUs, each of which can support 208 threads using SMT. So it's got huge numbers of threads, huge numbers of GPUs. Um, the, a scale of that system from a power standpoint, we had to build out power uh, out to 60 megawatts to support this system. And it wouldn't fit in this room. It's bigger than this room. Um, 166 cabinets, each cabinet is 8,000 pounds. That's the scale of Aurora. Um, we're now in stabilization on that machine. And early science will start happening in that full machine later this summer. And if you're interested, if you have projects, you should um, ping me. Let me talk about AI for a few minutes. Um, so what I'm spending almost all of my time on these days. Um, and a couple of years ago, we started imagining a large-scale program to follow on 
the Exascale program that would be focused on this idea of AI for science. And one of the reasons that we did that is that I, I, I have this great life. I mean, I I'm, live in the lab, I live in the university. Um, in the DOE lab system in the US, um, we have an amazing platform to do science, right? We have large number of experimental facilities, accelerators, electron microscopes. Um, we have light sources, we have neutron sources, we have uh, all kinds of equipment, we have large scale computers, um, we have 17 national laboratories that have tens of thousands of scientists and engineers, and we're the largest producer of both classified and unclassified science data in the world. And so we started thinking about with all of these assets, what can we do to drive forward on this notion of purpose-built AI systems to advance science? And so in the summer of 2019, and this sounds a familiar story to one of their earlier speakers, we uh, organized three big town hall meetings and then, a, and then a summary meeting that was held in Washington, D.C., and we gathered over 1,300 scientists to ask the question, what could you imagine doing with AI at scale in your scientific discipline? And we got a very large number of responses across the domains, biology, chemistry, materials, climate, high energy physics. People in high energy physics wanted to build an AI that could read all of the high energy physics data ever generated, right? And generalized from that. We talked about the mathematical research needed to support this. We talked about the software infrastructure, the hardware infrastructure, designing new classes of systems to drive AI. Right after this, this report came out and in, in, uh, right before the pandemic hit, early February of 2020, and there was an advice, uh, advanced scientific confusing uh, advisory committee that advises our program office that took up the charge to see whether there was a uh, a good reason to do a large scale program, they came back, yes. Um, and, uh, and then the pandemic hit, and everybody pivoted, right, for a long time. Last spring, we decided, gee, a lot has happened in the last three years, maybe we should revise this concept, because we were not making any headway. There had been, of course, an election, there had been other things going on. And so we, it's not that we love to do workshops, but we were desperate to get momentum and getting the government aligned behind the scale of investment needed to actually advance the opportunity. And so we did another series of workshops last summer. And uh, we held these at historically black colleges and minority serving institutions. So we went to Memphis State, we went to Bowie State, we went to University of California, Davis. And we organized ourselves differently. I'll talk about how we did that in a second. But what had changed in this three years? And this gives you a sense of how fast AI was moving, right? In between 19 and 22, well, chat GPT happened, right? Large language models went from a curiosity to an actual thing that's changing the world. Artificial image generation took off, right? Stable diffusion, other methods freaking out the artists and others, right? AI folded over a billion proteins. It's revolutionizing drug design. AI hints were used to encourage mathematicians to think about problems in a different way. Almost everybody who's a serious coder is now using some form of AI, either Copilot or just ChatGPT directly to generate code, right? There's a whole new class of architectures around AI that are more power efficient and purpose built to accelerate AI. We have new AI methods that can be used to accelerate HPC simulations, like through surrogates, and we got exascale machines. So a ton of stuff happened in three years. I mean, this was like a lifetime's worth of accomplishments in three years. So we redid this workshop series, and we organized it this time very differently. We said, the future is not a machine learned model for every data set that every researcher has in their pocket. Why is that? Well, first of all, there aren't enough people to build those models. There will be millions of data sets. You're not gonna have a million models. You're not gonna maintain a million models. It makes no sense. The future is not stupid, and that's a stupid vision of the future, right? That's one way to think about it. Instead, what we're seeing is a handful of super powerful models. Models that can do more than one thing, models that can do multitask models that are trained on large 
corpora of data, not a single data set. And we kind of saw that happening. We said, well, how does this affect science? What's the way to think about this in science? And so we said, okay, let's imagine six kinds of activities that AI could be doing in the future, and let's organize our teams of scientists to think through in these six buckets. So we came up with these six. One is advanced property prediction, inverse design. So is, can we build models that can tell us what to make, say a material or a chemical or a molecule, to achieve a certain purpose? Or to tell us the genome to make, to build a customized microbe for some purpose. So inverse design. AI and robotics, coupled, very powerful system that can do planning and can carry out automated experiments. So you can give a system a high level goal and it runs a whole room full of robots to drive towards that goal, whether that's material science, chemistry, biology, or whatever. AI based surrogates, can we take every single simulation that we run on a supercomputer and semi-automatically or maybe automatically consider how to replace the numerical integration scheme in those simulations, if it's that kind of simulation, with a replacement kernel that uses some kind of a AI model or a machine learn model to carry out that same function. And of course, we're seeing this happen in density functional theory. I'm using it in drug design. We're seeing it in climate. We're seeing it in fluid dynamics. It's happening over and over. In almost all cases, you can get massive speed ups, and depending on how you're using it, accelerate whatever the overall problem space you're doing. If you can get factors of 1,000, which seem to be relatively low hanging fruit, you can approach the problem differently. We're looking at AI for software engineering and programming. In the context of the Department of Energy, it's hard for us to count, but we think we have something over 10 billion lines of code that runs in our laboratories. 10 billion lines of code, it's a lot of code. We're constantly moving it to new architectures. We're constantly trying to update it, trying to refactor it, trying to prevent bit rop, you know, interfacing it to new APIs and so on. This idea of using AI systems to handle or to expand or enhance software development seems like a key step of productivity. This middle one down here, AI for prediction and control of complex systems. Many of the things that we're building, whether they're fusion reactors or fission reactors or power grid or an accelerator, have control systems. And classical control systems have gotten us to a certain point, but they don't give us anticipatory modeling in something like a fusion reactor that allows us to adjust the system to prevent disruptions, for example, or to run long plasma experiments. So this idea of building AI systems that can take us beyond classical control, this is also right at the heart of digital twins. And then finally, this notion of foundation models that give us assured information about scientific domain. So think GPT-4 or GPT-X, but now knowing about deep science and being able to be used to suggest new theories or to integrate across disciplines. So these were the six things that we worked on. We then map these against the different buckets that the Department of Energy does. Department of Energy does basic science research, does applied energy research, does national security research, and we did a like a cross-cutting matrix of these three areas across those six areas, and that gives you some sense as how the working groups were built. Let me look at one area that is, uh, of course, is super interesting. This is the foundation uh, model example, right? So foundation models, the term was coined a few years ago at Stanford's the Center for Human AI, um, but these are basically big models, right, that are trained on large amounts of diverse data. You can think of GPT is a good example. It doesn't have to be a, a, a transformer-based model, though. Um, you then uh, train this model, and then you're going to tune it or otherwise adjust it for some downstream task, maybe hundreds of downstream tasks or thousands of tasks. And you're going to treat this raw foundational model as a building block. It's almost always not the final product. Okay, and to give you a sense of, of how big these things are, right, GPT-4 is about a trillion parameters. Your brain 
at least some simple-minded estimate of your size of your brain is about 100 trillion parameters, if you count synapses as roughly parameters. So a GPT-4 type model is about 1% of a brain, right? And to train that kind of a model on enough data so that it behaves the way that you anticipate or that you want it to is, is probably somewhere in the 20 to 30 trillion tokens. Training it on about four or five trillion tokens is about an exaflop month. Okay, an exaflop month on our current exascale machines. Well, our machines cost about, the marginal cost of Frontier or Aurora is about $500,000 a day. So an exaflop month, right, it's about $15 million. So training GPT-4 on, a, on, a, on a, you know, enough data is probably somewhere in the 20 to $30 million range, to give you a sense of the scale of this. Now, foundation models for science, what would you use them for? Well, they can be used for summarizing and distilling knowledge. So one thing that's a real challenge for science is that we have millions of science papers, and at the same time, we pay lots of people to curate data to build structured databases, whether it's in bioinformatics or cheminformatics or materials science or pull out parameters for physics. It's a hugely labor-intensive task. It can be fun, but it's kind of something we should relegate to a machine. Foundation models can do that. My groups use them to actually distill knowledge around protein-protein interaction networks, and we can do in a weekend what would take human curators years to do with a foundation model. They can synthesize. Current models like GPT-4, well, it, it, it at least behaves like it's competent in about 20 to 25 programming languages, being able to translate between them. But it also knows over a dozen quantum computing libraries. It can write code against those. They can generate plans and puzzles. We've recently demonstrated we can use this to generate robotic instructions for our self-driving lab. We give it a high-level protocol, give it some hints as to what the instrumentation are, and it will write the protocol, and then we tell it we have this robot, it takes that protocol and compiles it to the instructions for the robots. So this is all great. There was a, a fun paper, I encourage you to read it. Um, you can see it here, Google it. Can ChatGPT be used to generate scientific hypotheses? This was an experiment done by some folks at MIT and Weizmann a few weeks ago. They spent about a week, they decided to treat the model like a colleague. And they started out saying, we will view this experiment as a success if at the end of the week, we want to take some of our limited experimental resources and put it into validating or attempting to validate new hypothesis that the model came up with. And they played with it. It's a great paper to read how they did it. They, they prompted it to have a a theory generator and a theory critiquer in the same prompt, so it was critiquing its own theories. At the end of the day, they said, after experimenting with GPT-4 in our own research domains in materials, chemistry, physics, and quantum information, we find that ChatGPT-4 is a knowledgeable, frequently wrong, and interesting to talk to. In other words, not unlike a college professor or a colleague, right? Most of your colleagues Probably don't like being told they're frequently wrong, but it's actually true, right, when you're brainstorming. So this is evidence that there's maybe something here. Now, after we ran these workshops last summer, we started seeing that, well, maybe we even had the model wrong. Maybe these six areas aren't really six areas after all. Maybe they're just all downstream use cases of one master model, one, you know, super intelligence, if you've been listening to Sam's global tour or whatever, how they talk about it. So this is something that we're very fascinated by, whether this is a model of the future. We won't really know unless we can try to do it. Of course, LLMs are being used in other specific domains. Like in our group, we've been using them to design protein sequences. We won Gordon Bell Award last year for building a large language model that essentially was trained on 200 million, 400 million protein sequences, and then was given the SARS-CoV-2 viral genomes across 8 million uh, virus samples. And it was able to, when we told it it didn't know about future variants, it could actually dream up the variants that we actually saw in the future. So it, it was very powerful 
But of course, that was a model just trained on proteins. Imagine if that model was integrated with everything else. And that's something that we're, let me try to get past this, trying to do. We're also looking at how we might use something like a language model to integrate many functions that we now do with separate models. Like we're working on uh, drug development and we have a model that predicts drug binding. We have a model that predicts drug response, that predicts cancer reoccurrence and so on. We think this now might be possible with a single model. So this is pretty interesting. Now, model, language model development has massively accelerated since 2019. I mentioned this earlier. Here's kind of a, uh, I don't know, phylogenetic tree, if you want to think of it, of language models. You can see from 2019 down here at the bottom, right, um, in the last couple of years, just an explosion of interest, right? The most capable models, of course, are in the private sector. Um, this chart, if you've had a chance to play, you know, GPT-4, still king of the world, GPT-3.5, maybe sub-king of the world, Claude is maybe, maybe in battle for a sub-king of the world, right? And then there's a huge gap to the open source models. A couple weeks ago, there was a model called Falcon that just got released. This is a model that was uh, trained and built at, uh, in Dubai, actually. First model out of the Middle East. It's very competitive. I've been experimenting with it last night when I couldn't sleep with jet lag. Um, I have all these standard test cases and it was, uh, it was doing quite well. It's fully open source. It's only 40 billion parameters, so it's much, much smaller than the trillion parameter GPT-4 model. Um, you can't quite run it on your laptop, but a uh, small GPU cluster, you can run it. If you want to play with this, go to Hugging Face, search for it. You'll get a live text window. I did this this morning, actually, just before coming over here. One of the things I asked it was, uh, which proteins interact with P53? P53 is a tumor suppressor protein. And unlike most tiny models, it actually gave a perfectly reasonable response. Right? Very impressive for an open source model. Totally open, totally, totally, totally open under Apache. Right? So we've been um, working on building a consortium to train a model of the same scale or beyond GPT-4 for science for a couple of years. We're very interested in collaborators on this. Um, this is gonna use a large amount of time on Aurora and Frontier this next summer and into the fall. These are folks involved in This also involves our collaborators at Riken, um, Satoshi Matsuoku, uh, folks from the Memorial Sloan Cancer Center, from the Allen Institute for AI, Barcelona Supercomputer Center, LRZ, and so forth. Lots of labs, a lot of hardware companies. Um, very fun project. Um, it's more than training a model. I won't go through all of this, um, but training the model gives us this first column. We have to do these other downstream things to get a useful system. We hold hackathons about every couple of months. If you're interested in coming over to Chicago, next one is in July. We'll have another one in August. Um, lots of work to be done. I'm gonna skip through this. Um, these are big computations. As I mentioned, training a, a model with about a trillion parameters is a, a lot of exaflop month. We're trying to get more efficient models, but you, know, you can do the math, you still get to this kind of uh, order of uh, four times 10 to the 25th flops, and how you divide that up by whatever machine, that's the amount of work you're gonna have to do. Um, now, one of the big challenges here is organizing data. So text is easy, text, code, multi-languages, English languages, or uh, Arabic languages, you know, any kind of language that's linear is relatively easy. Um, Roman uh, encoded language is quite easy. Um, some languages are, are not, there's not a lot of training data yet. Uh, for example, in Mandarin, we don't have a lot of training data. What we have to do though is get beyond easy to obtain text towards specialized knowledge bases that contain both text, papers, structured data, and scientific domain expertise data. And we're looking for groups to help curate that We've got it uh, right now split up into different tranches. We have one in biology, biochemistry, kind of drugs and medicine. We have another one in chemistry, materials and nanoscience. We have one in mathematics and physics, kind of the, the hard physics sciences, but we're looking for collaborators in climate, energy, energy density physics, and so on. And uh, training these things is not a 
launch a code and come back in a month. These models are very twitchy, they fall over. You're constantly uh, gathering checkpoints and debugging them. Like if anybody wants to hear the gory details, I'm happy to talk about it over beer. Um, but you also need to have an evaluation team. As you're building these models, we have to validate they're actually learning what we want them to learn and that they're actually converging uh, towards some reasonable behavior. And so almost all of the serious model building efforts turn into serious evaluation efforts. This was a paper from last year, um, one of the biggest computer science papers I know about called Big Bench, right? There's 400 authors collaborating and building over 200 tests to evaluate how good these large-scale AI models are becoming at solving these tasks, particularly large numbers of, of tasks in science, and we need more of this. This is gonna have to be some kind of a collective effort, right? Ultimately, thousands of these kinds of tests. And then we have to work on things after training these. So there's lots of important issues. I don't have time to go on with this. Once we have a model, though, we want to make this available in controlled ways to the research community to make headway. Now, um, in the US right now, and probably around the world, there's a lot of policy discussion about the risks associated with large language models. This paper came out um, last week on the archive. I encourage you to read it. They did an exercise for one hour, a class of non-scientific students. They broke into three groups, and they were given the task, figure out how to create a pandemic design a new microorganism, figure out how to synthesize the DNA, get that blueprint, and can you do it with a language model? The language model told them what they needed to know, how to, what pathogens were, where they could get synthesized DNA, which companies might be willing to synthesize it without asking any questions, and so forth. Some very fascinating paper to read. Just don't do it at home. All right, so we're working on a concept for a very large program. It's very large because to have impact in AI right now, you've got to build a large team. The team at OpenAI is 1,000 people. The team at DeepMind is 1,000 people. The team at Microsoft is 1,000 people. The team at Google Brain is 1,000 people. This is not something you can do with a small academic team. There's just too many moving parts. We're thinking of a program that looks something like this. At the top, is a science-based effort to get at the notion of responsible AI, human alignment. We're taking ethics, which you might think of as a humanities topic, or a social science topic, or a legal topic, and making it into a science topic. We need to figure out how to build models that actually can have ethical behavior. This is a science problem. We're gonna then have that cross cut on top of a whole bunch of large scale, what we call hub scale centers. In the US, hubs are about $25 million a year topical investments. And we imagine having about a dozen of those loosely organized around those six buckets I talked about. All of this we want sitting on common cross cutting AI technologies, common software stack, common frameworks, so forth, common math libraries. And then having that sit on top of a large amount of dedicated supercomputers and we're talking about many exascale class machines on the order of a dozen exascale class machines that are dedicated to this task. And then taking our experimental facilities that span the DOE, the, dozen, the light sources, the neutron sources, the microscopes, accelerators, so forth, and building a software layer and a common API in all of those facilities that can be driven by these AI systems. That's the vision. We think it'll take 10 years to do this public partnership, public-private partnership, to build this capability of accelerating science with AI, and of course, modeling and simulation is, is fully integrated with this. Now, one of the reasons we need to do that with federal investment is this chart. So the number of large-scale AI publications done by academia, essentially gone to zero in the US, around the world, actually. This resulted in a program uh, called NAIR in the US, program concept to invest in a national infrastructure to support AI research. Um, in that program, which is in addition to what I'm talking about on the Department of Energy side, they're advocating for another couple of exascale class machines worth of 
systems just to keep the educational system fully supplied with capability for training AI researchers. You know, I know I'm probably out of time. I'm gonna quickly just summarize where I think I'm at with respect to quantum and zeta scale. I'll do this quickly. So a big question we're constantly asked is why are we doing all this? Isn't quantum going to somehow make all of this irrelevant? And we're asked this actually a couple times a week. And the real question is, well, we wish this were true, right? We wish that we had some quantum technology that would change the computing complexity landscape fundamentally because it would make everything we're trying to do a lot easier. The reality is we don't see that anytime soon, right? The current state of quantum is small scale, noisy, circuit based model, unreliable. Yes, people are working on error mitigation and so on, but what do we actually need to move the needle is something like <clears throat> this here. We need machines with thousands of reliable virtual qubits, means they're sitting on probably millions of physical qubits, right? And we need these to have fast clocks because almost all of the problems that people care about that we can imagine doing with a quantum machine is gonna need thousands of qubits, re you know, reliable qubits, and maybe 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th gate operations. At a microsecond, 10 to the 12th gate operations is running that machine for two weeks, nonstop, no failures, right? Because it's quantum, you can't restart. So two weeks. Put that in your head for a second. So how could we do this? Well, we probably don't have enough money to do this and everything else we're trying to do, but we also need to find more super polynomial algorithms. We only have a handful. We have two or three technologies that might be able to get to a million physical qubits or beyond, so we need to push on all of them. Ion traps or neutral atoms, photonic qubits, superconducting qubits, Majorana qubits, if we can make those work. We have to have technology that can scale up. We have to have fab paths to build this, right? A lot of hardware interface to classical machines. I don't have time to go into the algorithm space, except that we are deathly short of enough exponential algorithms to make this happen currently. So we need a lot more algorithm research. Maybe with some of the recent results in faster sorting algorithms coming out of DeepMind, one target application for the AI systems would be coming up with some better quantum algorithms. One of the big challenges here is that we need problems where we can describe the problem in a small number of bits or qubits, large intermediate state, and then sample that state to get to a readout. Many problems don't look like this. Anything with real data doesn't look like this, right? But one thing that people have to understand is that a large scale quantum system, say a million qubits, is also gonna be a massively large classical system. Every QPU is gonna have dozens or hundreds of classical processors to actually care and feed it. It's kind of like a neuron and glial cells in your head. So if you look at all the tools, everything is always a mixed paradigm, right? You've got work the classical machine has to do, work the quantum machine has to do. Work the classical machine has to do, work the quantum machine has to do. And here you've got color coded in terms of classical is brown, quantum is blue, okay? All of these paradigms are a mixture, right? So real quantum machines, at the scale that will work on real problems are gonna be massive classical machines as well. Now, we're thinking about what targets might actually be worth doing this for. In the US, there's this concept of utility scale quantum computing. Utility scale means simply the following. The value of the computation that we can do on the system is worth more than the cost of the system. Think of this as like a break even infusion, but applied to computing, right? In classical computing, this has been true for a long, long time. In quantum computing, this has not been true ever yet, right? There's some possible real targets. The one that is maybe the nearest is this notion of doing electronic structure solving for important catalysts, whether CO2 cracking, nitrogen fixation, these are trillion dollar industries, right? If we can do it, if we can solve room temperature biocatalysis for those problems, that could be worth a huge amount of money, right? And the issue is how big of a problem are these computationally. There's a lot of people 
framing these problems, but the bottom line is thousands of qubits, billions of trillions of gate applications. Now, lots and lots and lots of tables on this, always the same answer, okay? Thousands of qubits, reliable qubits, billions to trillions of gate operations. Nobody's got something faster than that. People are trying to make, uh, Psyquantum's done some great job of trying to optimize it, but you're still in this space of, of thousands with trillions. So what might this cost? Well, this is a big problem. Current costs in quantum, about five cents per qubit second. Five cents for a single qubit for one second, okay? If you look at how long it would take, to, if you were Getty, this is what happens if you charge less than that. Never mind, it's a joke, um, if you're following this. If you look at three example problems at that cost, today's cost, for, for the scale of the computation necessary to solve it, two of these chemistry problems and one factoring problem, the cheapest one is $5 billion, right? More expensive one, $20 billion. Well, these problems are probably not easily worth that today. So how can we fix this? Well, in history, there has been one technology that had, say, a factor of 10,000 cost reduction. It was the transistor, right? And we might ask ourselves, how long did that take? Anybody know? There's a chart here, you can read it, maybe. It took about 20 years for transistors to go down five orders of magnitude in price. So the question is, can we get to a million qubits, a million qubits second at $5 per second by 2043? That would be a 20 year projection. If we can do that, why is that important? Because that means one of these exemplar quantum calculations would cost on a per week basis the same as we cost on exascale today. And we know that we can solve problems at that value proposition. So to get this to simply half a million dollars a week, we have to have this five order magnitude reduction. We're not sure whether that will happen, but we want it to happen, right? We just have to put this on a, a realistic timeline. Now, why am I gonna talk about zeta scale? I'm almost done, it's kind of the end here. So one of the challenges is that we have to realize that we have to continue to make progress on classical computing. Any scenario post exascale, whether it's AI driven or whether it's a hybrid quantum classical machine is going to need progress on the underlying classical computing technology. We've gotta build way more efficient systems from an energy perspective to train large scale AI models. The trend is in that direction. And if we're gonna build quantum systems whose price isn't dominated by the classical part of the system, We've gotta have orders of magnitude reduction on the classical side. Both of these point to the need for a long-term zeta scale push. And these machines might be quite different from our current supercomputers. One thing that could be quite different is the amount of double precision they have. It might be very small relative to the amount of low precision they have. That's a way to get power efficiency, but AI doesn't need 64-bit, right? So mixed precision algorithms where we can get by with a minimal amount of 64-bit and a lot of low precision, FP16 or FP8 is the way of the future, among other things. Now, there was a paper a couple years ago, came out of the NUDT in China that made, uh, this is kind of a fun paper, I think, they were trying to sketch out what would a zeta scale machine look like, and they laid out these specs. And for fun, earlier this year, I said, well, how much of a fantasy is this? You know, and uh, so we did some analysis and we said, well, okay, for each of the metrics that they projected, what would be the compound annual growth rate of progress to achieve that value, that metric by 2035, okay? And just to make it simple, I put it in ratios of Frontier, okay? Since Frontier exists and it's a exascale machine, so of course we're talking about something like 600 times faster than Frontier. To hit it by 2035, that means 58% compound annual growth rate. We've never hit that, right? Power, maybe, right? Power efficiency, 200 times faster, or 200 times more. Peak performance per node, 
right? Maybe 60 times more, right? A bandwidth between those, maybe 16x. That maybe is achievable. That's 20% per year, right? Memory bandwidth, storage capacity, not likely. So zeta scale actually is, turn, is gonna turn out to be very hard. On exascale, you know, we had been running about 10 years in between three orders of magnitude. So going from Terra to um, Peta, right, uh, or uh, yeah, um, took about 10 years, right? Peta to, to Exa took us uh, closer to 15 years, right? Um, so we are probably in this 15 to 20 year time frame on Zeta. It's much, much harder. So we are still planning, however, to continue procuring next generation systems. We're actually, even though we're standing up our exascale systems now, we're already working on the next iteration of procurement. And to give you some sense of the kind of targets we're looking for, if we, if we follow the, tr the historical pattern, we would be looking at a machine about 8x our current exascale machines for the next iteration, say in 28. And if you multiply that out against the different precisions on our machine, you'd see something on the, on the right-hand side here. We're looking at a machine that might be 18 to 20 exaflops double precision. And in BFP 16 for matrix operations, about 300 exaflops. So about a third of the way towards a zeta scale in very low precision. Lots of lots of open questions here on how to do that. So let me just summarize. I'm sorry for about the time. Um, what are our main observations here? One is that this push towards AI for science, it's probably the most important thing we need to do right now. Um, and we need to do this because we have to understand what's possible in AI. We have to use it to advance scientific computing, but we also have to use it to, to help the planet in some sense have rational regulation about where AI is going at scale. Right? Lots of use cases in traditional scientific computing. We need to push towards underlying improvements in classical performance because we need that for training larger AI models and we need it to drive hybrid quantum systems. And we need to look very hard at special purpose hardware for underlying problems where we can get a big win without paying the freight for entire, uh, you know, complete generality. And we think in AI, brain scale systems, right, systems that could train 100 trillion parameter networks, that's a good target. And some kind of quantum hybrid system for quantum chemistry, we think that is a very plausible target. So with that, let me stop. This is the path forward. It's easy Q, it's easy to say, easy to remember. It's not all about quantum though. Thank you. It uh, also can be bought with beer. It's very easy. The FinFET bought us a bit of time yes. and effort. Um, when are we moving away from silicon and other things just for the ordinary computing? And how? when does TikTok stop? And, the, and the, the, the scaling law doesn't go forever. Sure. You run yeah. into atoms. So D Denard scaling, of course, stopped. Uh, FinFET's given way to all around gates, right? A lot of new technology there. Um, it's a good question. I think the big players, TSMC, Intel, Samsung, still think there's another 10 years worth of silicon headroom. So I think we're probably okay for about 10 years. It gets more messy after that. Um, there are, of course, attempts to look at other substrates, whether it's nanotubes or proteins or whatever, but nothing is remotely close to silicon in terms of scalability. So I think it's, uh, you know, there's gonna be a big search. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, silicon photonics clearly have to happen. There's, there's other possibilities, but nothing is remotely mature enough to take over from silicon in this 10 year time frame, is, is, is my concern. Hi, Rick. Um, quick question on the on the Zeta scale sort of time frame. Um, so we've seen the number of machines in the in the top, you know, ten, you know, decreasing. You know, all up as Moore's laws it sort of disappeared quite a bit. 
How many Z-scale machines do you expect, even in the US, in that time frame, in the in 2038 time, time in the, frame? In the 2040 time frame? Yeah, okay, 2040. Well, I, I think what's gonna happen is you're already gonna see, you're already starting to see this, is that uh, companies like NVIDIA are building machines that are customized, that are super pods for training AI, right? And these are gonna be exascale class, low precision machines, and the issue is, are those going to become the dominant building block, right? And my guess is yes, right? So what's gonna happen is that, you know, if you talk to Intel or AMD or NVIDIA or even the, the Chinese GPU makers, nobody really wants to build more FP64 into these devices because they have a hard time selling that capability and it's not as efficient as doing much more low precision hardware support. So the question for us really is what do we mean by a machine that's Zeta scale? As I pointed out by this next iteration, by the end of uh, the current decade, we will have machines that are somewhere between a third and a half of a Zeta scale machine in low precision, right? So I, I think that's gonna happen and that will happen almost by just following the current trend. But we're not gonna be anywhere near that in in high precision, right? Now, the other challenge, I suppose, is where are these machines going to go? Um, clouds are gonna deploy a lot of them. Private companies are gonna deploy a lot of them, particularly if they have AI that's got sensitive data, they're not gonna to wanna to put it in clouds and so on. So it's gonna be a comp, the landscape's gonna be evolving in this complicated way. But, you know, it's easy to make a prediction that there'll only be a handful of machines in some time frame at some capability. Everybody, you know, Ken Olson made that prediction, Watts, you know, IBM made that prediction, so that's a cheap prediction to make. I think we will see increasing demand for large-scale machines for training AI models, and I think we're capable of building such machines. If you look at the amount of installed base used for Bitcoin, if you imagine just replacing that installed base with brain float 16 with enough interconnect, we would have many Zeta scale machines. So I, I don't see it as a fundamental challenge with respect to resources or power or anything like that. It's just a decision about what we want to do. Hi, um, coming back to the foundation ID model, AI model you had there. Just a, asking a quick comment on ownership of IP and usage of confidential data because in my sector, in the biotech, every biotech organization builds their own model at the moment. I assume for that main reason, because they don't want to share <coughs> their data, and especially they don't want to share the models outside. So wondering if you had any concept on that to solve that. It may be an old idea, right? I mean, humans, we constantly share confidential data with humans uh, if they're not allowed to make a copy external to the human, but they're exposed to it and you benefit from it, right? One concept that might be evolving, and there's several concepts here, but one is this notion of distributed federated learning. If we can figure out how to do that so the data stays where it lives and the models kind of get passed around, that's hard to do with large language models at scale. Another concept uh, you know, that is, uh, is being explored is this notion of streaming data for training, so you never actually store the data, so it'd be the equivalent of you showing me something and I never actually am able to write it down, but I get to benefit from it. Um, an extreme version of that is, uh, you know, techniques that, we don't, that don't exist yet today exactly, but where we can train models on encrypted data um, without decrypting it. Um, that works, but it's very inefficient, like orders of magnitude inefficient. I, but I think we will, this notion of data rights is going to evolve. I think, um, and you know, this is probably more of a beer conversation about where it could go. But I think, you know, this idea of a, a very large-scale generative AI model—if you think of it as like a super intelligence for, for a second—is going to change so many things that this idea of a little bit of private data that somehow I'm going to be basing my business on or whatever, that if I hold it tight is gonna matter, maybe that will matter less in the future. Maybe what will matter more in the future is your ability to leverage that capability and less about owning the data. 
I think we'd have to debate that over quite a lot of beer, actually, to get headway on it. Um, I guess you have some good beer here in Australia, so <laughs> I look forward to testing that hypothesis. Please join me thanking Rick for his presentation. Thank you.